a professional parapsychologist who have an investment in the field? And how much do you, if you've talked with these people, do you get a sense that they have such a personal investment in the study that it's hard for them to look, like when you were presenting the data and you saw the, the line go down, and that's contrary to how a functioning science should go up, why can't they see that so clearly? The question is, uh, when I talk to parapsychologists and stuff like that, uh, and you point out that the effect size is going down over time, uh, and, and even if it weren't going down, if it were flat even, it should be going up if it's a progressive science, and they really are getting control of, of things. Uh, and when I talk to parapsychologists, what do they say about that? Why can't they see it? Actually, to be fair, uh, the first people begin pointing this out is um, uh, this Dutch parapsychologist, Bierman, I think he is. And he's a very, I, I think, very respectable guy. Uh, and uh, he pointed out in a long article he had, and he was on, at that time, bringing that up because he wanted to point out that, you know, we parapsychologists got to worry about the fact that our phenomena are so elusive. And also, we have this decline effect that over time it seems to be going away. And that may be a characteristic of the phenomenon itself. Maybe we got that kind of phenomenon that does that. Uh, but uh, we've got to be careful about claiming replicability and other stuff. We've got to be careful about this. And there are different parapsychologists. There's a man named Stanley Krippner, who actually, in, if you read what he does and stuff like that, it's pretty far out stuff. You know, you, he's into shamanism and stuff like that. On the other hand, he's a very fair minded guy. He's uh, uh, just recently published a book where he got skeptics and believers together. I mean, we weren't together in, in a sense physically, but we wrote articles on our view of the, I, I, I said the, I wrote an article on uh, parapsychology is dead, you know, it's gone. <laughs> and parapsychologists don't realize it, but it is. And uh, but I, did my, I did it the nicest way I could and I got, uh, you know, tried to tell them they can go into other fields, you know, there's other things they can do. Life is not over if parapsychology isn't real, but I, I did it a nice way anyways. I, I did it my best, putting together my best arguments. And they had other people on the other side, and it was a mixed bag of things. But the interesting thing about this book, they uh, uh, then, after we each contributed our chapters, they let us comment on other chapters and start, put those in as well. You can't do it all, but we did that. And so we got into some, and there was one parapsychologist, uh, some of them are, were, were reasonable, but one was, I would consider a very unreasonable guy. His idea that people like me are charlatans and uh, we're just uh, putting down things anyway and what have you. And uh, very nasty, he wrote a whole book about this as well, a British, young British fellow. And he wrote a chapter, but he then commented on my chapter, and he was writing, and he wrote it down. But Kripner was always very careful to make sure I got all this and apologized for anything he said, and he said, you, you know, a lot of this is uncalled for. Kripner was very fair. So fair that um, I didn't tell this story, did I, DJ, about the uh, Randy and, and Kripner, have I? No. Well, uh, in... Uh, not, not in this course. You did it in right. an interview before, but not... Okay. Um, in, uh, I think it was in the 70s, after you know, Geller had just come on the scene and stuff like that, and both Randy and I were then involved in being uh, the major antagonists. Major Geller, uh, Randy, the major one, real big major one, getting right. Uh, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the people who publish Science Magazine, at their annual convention in San Francisco, decided to have a, uh, a, a, a session on skepticism and uh, on the paranormal, and Randy was on it, I was on it, there may have been a few other people too, and it was a, I think it was a half day thing, but Randy and I were on it, and they were, as I said, there may be a few other people on it as well, that I don't remember who, who, who the others were, but the whole front row in this uh, room uh, of the hotel where they're having the conference, whole front row was, or, or, I, I recognize many of them, were, was occupied by parapsychologists. They were ready to attack us, you know, defend their, their, their thing here. And I don't think they, they, 
they should have had parapsych maybe some parapsychologists on the panel too, but I think it was all loaded in this case with science with non parapsychologists on our panel. And uh, afterwards though, Stanley Kripney, uh, Kripney was one of the major parapsychologists in the Bay Area. Stanley came up to me, uh, we've always been reasonably friends, he's a nice guy actually, and came up to me and said, Ray said, could we invite you while you're here in, in San Francisco? Tonight, come to, we're having a meeting of the local parapsychologists, the Bay Area parapsychologists. Could you come and speak to us? I said, yeah, okay, so I did, I came. And they weren't interested in talking about me. They, everything they, as soon as I walked in there, they were all asking me questions about Randy. <laughs> they said, why is Randy so, so mad at us? Why is he always putting us down? Why is he so unfair? And I says, don't ask me, ask Randy. <laughs> He said, would he come? I said, I don't know, but he's here in, in San Francisco. I know he and I were going to be for another few days in San Francisco. I says, ask Randy. I, I, I says, uh, why don't you invite him to come while he's here? And I says, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him uh, when I go back. And I'm, I'm sure he, if he has the time, he'd be willing to talk to me. He says, you mean Randy would talk to us? I says, yeah, sure. Uh, and so I talked to Randy, and Randy was happy to come. So next night, Randy and I both together came to the parapsychologist. And they were ready for bear. I mean, they were, they were yelling at him. It was a yelling session for uh, I don't know how long it was, but pretty soon. But Randy never lost his cool and was calm and very polite. And they were yelling at him and saying, "Why are you this and this?" And Randy would tell me, give him an answer of some sort. But and not, and not he wasn't very um, being provocative at all. And pretty soon things began getting calming down, and very soon it was all lovey dovey. And they were talking to each other. This guy is, you know, he's a nice guy, Randy. You know, and he's he's not he's not a, a, a devil. He doesn't have horns or anything like that. And suddenly, they all were pulling copies of Randy's book on the magic word go. I was at Parker's and they'd come up and say, "Could you write autograph a book?" So it was a nice session. And and Krippner, who was then the head of the group there, uh, he and Randy became friends. And ever since then, they still are friends. And any time, many times in, in investigations, uh, there is a program that, a major program that Randy uh, had on 1989. It was the first, the Fox Network first came on the air. We were the first program they did. And it was a two hour program. Uh, Bill Bixby was the uh, moderator on testing psychic powers live. And uh, the premise of the show was that. Um, there would be psychics uh, who would challenge Randy, and uh, I was the one who was, and Crip, Crip and I were, were a team, so this is an example of how Randy does work with, and many parapsychologists were very happy to work with Randy. We were a team, Randy, uh, Crip and I were formed, appointed by Randy to be a team, so we would arrange to have tests that we could do on television, uh, that, that could be definitive, to see whether the psychics who could challenging Randy could, could actually do what they claimed to do. And we had to work that out, so it was Tripp and I who did all this. And, uh, and there have been other cases where, uh, several cases where Randy has contacted Krippner and make sure that what he was doing was okay with Krippner and stuff like that. And so there is this, unknown story that Crady has some good friends in the parapsychological community. It doesn't bother him that they are parapsychologists who believe differently from him. At least they're willing to go by scientific method and, and, and agree with certain conditions and so on, and there's no problem there. And most people don't realize that. Any other questions? Oh, by the way, I don't think I answered your question. <laughs> I, uh, <Okay>. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it's a mixed bag, uh, you know, I, I, I've known, uh, Krippner is a good guy, and he's ne never had this problem with him, but I've met other parapsychologists. My first time I really got to meet uh, some of them and real, you have some real time with them. In 1979, I think, maybe, maybe 89, I'm not, I mean, it could be 10 years off, and I'm so, I, you know, now time is, is, is fuzzy with me. But anyways, I think it was 1979, the parapsychologists had their major annual meeting, a parapsychological association, in um, uh, St. Mary's College in Orinda, California. And they invited me to come 
and pay my expenses and stuff because they wanted to show me, I guess, that they didn't have horns and 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 you know I was a major critic, so they wanted to, me to mix with them and I don't know. So so they so that happened. It was a good 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 time I had there, but except they had a spoon bending party, they wouldn't let me go to that because they didn't want any skeptics ruining the spoon bending. Uh, and um, there were a few other things they barred me from. As a result, some parapsychologists got very mad and decided to stay with me and not go to any functions because they thought, as their guest, I should be allowed to go to anything that they go to, right? Uh, so I got to know a lot of them that way. And uh, Robert John was there and, uh, and some other people. And uh, some became very good friends. Some of them, I was surprised to find, uh, agree with me that even though they're willing to believe, they believe something is real. Like one of the parapsychologists passed away. He was from, uh, he had the major chair, he's Swedish. Martin Johnson was his name. He was from Swedish. I don't know, I know, didn't know, I guess Martin Johnson could be swear, a Swedish name. But he held the only major parapsychological position in the university, and that was the University of Utrecht, Utrecht in uh, the Netherlands, which still has a parapsychology department. But he was the head of it, so. He was, had a special position there. Well, he was there, he's a major parapsychologist, and he, became, he was one of the people that refused to uh, go to any functions that I was not allowed to go to. So several times he and I were alone. <laughs> we got to be very good friends. And he turned out to be a very good friend. And he, to my surprise, told me, look, I think basically you're right, Ray. That, uh, and, and he turns out he's written articles for parapsychology. He says, look, we should, we parapsychologists, I'm do making a terrible mistake trying to get the scientific community to take us seriously. We're asking them to look at our data and say, look, we are a real science. Take, we've got something here. We don't have anything. We have a mess. <laughs> we should clean up our mess first before we ask the outsiders to come in and look at it. And uh, yes? Uh, you said earlier that mentalists were confused people. I say that's just a bias. What does that mean? I can't prove it. That's <laughs> my opinion. I, I'm, I think. So, I, so what do you mean by that? Oh, uh, there was on the. Uh, we're talking about para, well, cold reading, I, an accent. Uh, parapsychologists, uh, mentalists, uh, most mentalists I know look at cold reading and cold readers as with, with awe. It's much like the parallel would be that many, many card magicians, card manipulators, stuff like that, look at these gamblers who have these reputation being able to deal second deals and stuff like that flawlessly. They look upon them as, as something big. Uh, they don't realize that um, these gamblers who can do that, do a good second deal that's uh, flawless, that's all they do. That's their whole life. And, if they, and, and the ones that they know of, they know of because those guys do it so well that they, they still are alive. They, they didn't get caught. The ones that got caught are, are dead, believe me. Uh, so, but, but there's many crooked gamblers that magicians admire and think they're somehow super to them are actually only good at one thing. And if a guy, some specialize in bottom building, some specialize in other things. Uh, they're different things, but, they're, but they do that one thing over and over again. Magicians are different. It's a different a animal, but somehow uh, card magicians worship and think the ideal is to be like these gamblers, these crooked gamblers. It's, I think, in some sense, mentalists do the same thing with psychic readers, cold readers. They look at them as somehow the top of the game of what they're trying to be. But if you think of mentalists, it's supposed to be entertainment. It's, it's, it's a show. It's like a magic show, but it's now done with mind reading type, supposedly, things. And um, the other thing they admire about uh, cold readers, I think, is because the psychics actually pretend and, and, and claim to be real psychics. But mentalists have come a part of the magic community, a very uncomfortable part, but they're part of the magic community. And the magic community gets very upset with them if they imply that they are real. Because there's, there's, there's an ethical issue here. And that fight still goes on. So their mentors are quite confused in the sense that they admire, they think their, their ideal is the psychic reader. And psychic readers are not entertainers. They're dealing with problems, real problems that people have, and it's a dangerous. We pointed this out when we talked about the ethics. 
So in that sense, that's what I meant that there's that mentalists are confused people. That's all. Maybe I should shouldn't shouldn't have said confused people. They they they're, they're dishonest people. That's all. I should be nicer. Yeah. Not dishonest. They're conflicted. Let me self say internally conflicted. I think. That's better. That's better. Yes. Yeah. Given that they were such a small, significant thing, did they use the excuse of, well, only a small percentage of people have the capability, and so you would expect to have large, you know, differences between. And you're, 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 you're getting you're getting at the issue of uh, the size of the effects. They tend to be small. Well, and, then, and so yeah. They're probably, you know, this one may have, may have statistically gotten more people. Who are good, whereas the replicator over in yes. here. Yes. Uh, if it's a small effect, yeah. that will happen, yeah. In fact, this is, in fact, a criticism that uh, Jessica Utz, who is a very nice person in many ways, she's a, a very good statistician, and she gets very upset with me when I say it, but I think a very poor uh, parapsychologist in the sense that, uh, as a good statistician, she accepts the data that comes out of parapsychology and does very good statistics on it. But it's the same thing garbage in, garbage out. If you're taking bad data, so she's not an experimentalist, she's a statistician. She's getting the data after the fact. She's not there, she doesn't know how to judge what is good data. So what's going into her sausage machines, it could be good, after it goes in there, she's doing good, good grinding, but it's, she's grinding bad stuff, you know. And then she doesn't like that, she gets very upset when I say that. So uh, I apologize, <laughs> Jessica, wherever you are. Uh, she's a good statistician and a very good person. Uh, but she, her point is, to come back to what you asked your question, her, her point is that because the effects sizes in parapsychology tend to be slow, weak and, and, and small, that uh, it's going to be, there's going to be, uh, you know, repeatability is going to be very difficult because the power of the test that you're using is very low. You get a very, every time you do a, a experimental tests in parapsychology, with the low effect, it's going to be harder to find, unless you have a huge effect, a huge number of cases. And so that is her explanation of why, two things, why it's seemingly so that the results are erratic, and second thing is why we need meta-analysis to compensate for, by com combining uh, lots of different experiments that have already been done, uh, you get a, a the equivalent of making big, much larger sample size and getting more power and more likely to, to get a significant effect that way. That's, that's her argument. Mm -hmm. So it is an argument that people, parapsychologists do make. They take advantage, like we all do, of every, every, every possibility of justifying their particular cause. Can they explain why it's such a small effect? Yes, because it's uh, the nature of the beast. Uh, it's a small effect, they just, they don't, Try to justify it, but this is it. You know, you're studying something. We don't know what, you, what it is. See, another serious problem with parapsychology, extremely serious problem. I point this out in, in several articles. In fact, in that chapter I did on why smart people can be so stupid, in that book, the dark chapter, I pointed out examples of uh, scientists who have uh, done some very stupid, maybe stupid things. Uh, there is Levier, the guy, the guy who discovered uh, the planet Neptune by purely mathematical reasoning and uh, he never looked into the telescope and it's considered an amazing <coughs> thing. He just analyzed the data of previous people and discovered that there was, a, a, there was a anomaly and, and made a prediction of that there would be a planet at this point and it came out to be planet ne Neptune. He used the same calculations to deal with the uh, uh, oddities in the perihelion of Mercury and decided that this could be accounted for by a planet, an inner planet uh, inside between Mercury and the Sun. And he made predictions of when it was going to be and during that time all the telescopes of the world were on that spot where he predicted this new uh, planet <coughs> and no one saw it, and a few people did, you know, you have these erratic mm -hmm. things, some people thought they saw it and some people said, well, it's just sunspots you're seeing. And uh, then they had to wait till the next eclipse of the sun to make this picture of it. And again, he made the prediction again and where it would be and people. And pretty soon, the scientific community, astronomy and stuff, they had decided there is no such, by the way, by this time he had named the planet Vulcan. So it was called a planet and he had no doubts that it existed. And uh, 
Whereas he had waited till the astronomers had saw, it, saw the planet he predicted before he named a planet called Neptune. And um, so uh, until his death, unfortunately, he was the last one. He still believed in the planet of Vulcan and he went to his deathbed. But he, he believed it because he, his calculations had worked and it, it, he got a tremendous uh, notoriety. In fact, at that time, there were parades for Bevier all over um, Europe and especially in France, and he got all kinds of honors. People said he was the next best thing, to, biggest thing since Newton, because he had uh, saved the Newtonian system by finding this, uh, accounting for the para this, this anomaly, in order to explain, in the perihelion of the orbit of um, Mercury, by finding this planet that just about fixed everything. Uh, and it wasn't until um, maybe 50 or 60 years after. Uh, uh, Levier's death that Einstein's general theory of relativity uh, fixed the whole thing. It, it exactly predicted the account for the perihelion, the anomalies in the perihelion. But anyways, I had a lot of examples like that of scientists, uh, of scientists making goofs and send, and then there are a lot of things that, uh, uh, like the uh, N-rays and stuff like that where scientists for years uh, were discovering these end rays and work with them, it turned out to be no such thing. So I gave examples like that and said, now look, uh, when we no longer could, scientists no longer could replicate it, they gave up on it. But one thing that no one gives up on in, is the field of parapsychology. They consistently keep finding uh, their, their original paradigms that they had in the past don't work and they give up on those, but they start again with a new one. You know, they, they don't just give up. Well, I, th I think we're uh, pretty much done. You have one sentence sort of uh, take-home message about the cor course you want to tell everybody, and we'll finish up. Yeah, the take-home message, I repeat it again and again, I hope you get it, is that um, there are a lot of reasons why smart people, intelligent people, can go badly wrong. And in fact, unfortunately, in some cases, it's just because they're intelligent that they can defend, successfully defend a, an erroneous belief because they use their intelligence to do that. And uh, the most important thing about being able to think well about any issue is to start with good data, good quality data. That's a hard thing to come by. And most of the data that you're got, being asked to judge and stuff like that come from unaided observation or things that happen unexpectedly and so on. And if you try to think about those, uh, that day and use that day in your thinking, it's going to be contaminated and it's not, not going to have good thinking. So the most important thing is to make sure you've got good data and then think well about it and you'll be fine. <laughs>